here we won a school for the arts amongst many, many other places. He received numerous awards for his work, including the Phelan Art Award in Photography, and more recently, the Eureka Fellowship. McFarland, who was once a student of Larry Sullivan, now teaches at San Francisco State University and is represented by Case Marker Green Gallery in San Francisco. Please join me in welcoming the show. artist and educator. Um, we have Mike Light's work in the back and then Dave McKenna's piece over on that wall. All right, so I came to the museum yesterday and I sat in here for about an hour thinking about what I was supposed to say. So I came up with a lot of stuff, to, so um, hopefully I can do this in a concise manner. Um, these are three pictures that Larry made in the kind of like the last five years of his life, from about 2004 to 2009. Um, and if you look at all of the work that he made, there was kind of one kind of set, one theater that he used continuously. I would say even going back to the body of work evidence, which kind of pulled pictures from archives that turned this kind of like science fact into science fiction, they were the places that people worked who lived in the suburbs. Um, and then you can kind of look at pictures from home, which is one of Larry's most well-known bodies of work, which is about his parents, and kind of about the self-reflective uh, project about what it's like to grow up in the suburbs. And then you look at the valley, which was photographs of um, pornography being filmed inside of suburban neighborhoods. And then you look at Homeland, which also uses the suburbs as this like kind of set for um, making these pictures. I give my beginning photography students this assignment, and it's to approach making photographs in kind of two really distinct ways. And this is written about by Edie Coleman in the 1970s, one of which is to photograph in a responsive manner, to kind of when you walk around, say you're a street photographer, and you see something happen, and then you respond to it by taking a picture of it. The photographer doesn't really have any intervention necessarily directly in the events. The other way of making a photograph is making it in a directorial manner. And that's that you make a situation happen that normally would not have happened, and the only reason it happened is so that you could take a photograph of it. And I think what's really amazing about these works is they use that device and they oscillate in between this place of fact and fiction, of things that are fabricated and things that are real. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Does that make sense? I'm not going to say that again because you're not my students. Sorry. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that makes these works incredibly poignant is these were made during kind of like the beginning of the housing crisis, um, the mortgage crisis in 2008, which we know kind of exploded. Um, it's, it's, I think, really important to point out that Larry kind of had his finger on the pulse of what was going on without even kind of knowing about it. You know, and now, which I'll talk about in a little bit, these pictures are actually really relevant to a lot of um, stuff happening in contemporary politics in terms of like immigration and class inequality. So basically the premise of this project, which is called Homeland, was that um, you know, the suburbs kind of exist as this character, as this theater, and he would hire day laborers here, and you can see them in this picture and in the one on the far right, and he would have them kind of pose in this landscape. And they weren't just posing in any landscape, they were posing in a landscape that kind of had some sort of new construction. New construction that was suburban. Not only that, but they all have this really strong evidence of a border. You know, you can see the border here, you can see these green hills, you can see the roads, and then you can see this obvious kind of brand new housing development. Um, 
Another thing that's really important about this work is these aren't just you know, any old people in any old place. Every single one of these pieces has a title and a city attached to it. And so you can actually look up and learn a little bit more about these things. I don't know if that was Larry's intention. In fact, there's actually really very little documentation of what he was doing with this work. I remember working in a studio with him and he was incredibly self-conscious of this work, you know, worrying if it was derivative of other photographers working in a highly, highly directorial mode like Jeff Wall or Gregory Crutzen. Um, but I think this work is amazing. Um, another thing about these pieces I think that's really quintessentially Larry's work is the fact that these are really dramatic. I remember working in the studio and he was, I was saying, well, how do you want this to look? And he said, I, I want it to look biblical, but not too biblical. <laughs> you know, he wanted, this, he wanted this drama, but he knew the importance of the understated. He knew that in order to get at something really weird and really odd, you had to make it incredibly ordinary. Um, and this picture kind of has these beautiful little secrets. If you look right in this area, you can see this man's reflection in that puddle. You know, and I think there's a lot of self-reflection as we go through these pieces. So this is, this is Novato 2009. Novato. Novato. Um, this is Iselton, California, um, which is kind of a fascinating place. These um, houses are built in the middle of a floodplain. When Larry decided to go and photograph Iselton, its population was actually declining. It's a city of about 800. Um, and these, these four houses kind of exist as these really interesting characters in this work. You know, there's, there's the character of the suburbs as both a character and a set in these houses. And I think these houses are really kind of amazing because they were actually built to feel like a Victorian village. <laughs> Not kidding, they're actually all still on the market too. I looked them up on Zillow this morning. <laughs> um, and they're built with this garage on the bottom so that it wouldn't flood. It was a housing development that basically never took off. But I think what these houses represent to me more than anything is this, this, this like dream of a home and what it could be. And then when it falls apart, you know, when it's kind of really just a facade and really nothing more than kind of like a box and maybe a possibly really misplaced location like Iselton. In terms of the way the photograph was taken, I kind of feel like it was made probably at night with moonlight. Um, if you're familiar with another Bay Area photographer for his work, Todd Heido, he often uses this this like um, this like cover of night to create this curiosity or this longing of what's happening in these houses. And if you look at the rest of Larry's work, he sought out porn sets inside of Burbank homes owned by dentists and lawyers. So he was really interested in kind of what happened behind closed doors. Uh, I'm going to walk over to that one. So is that the Delta? I this is the Delta. So yeah. The swamp. yeah, and this, this housing project never took off. These are the only model homes they ever built and to a first sale. You can go, you can buy one of these if you want. You can move there. <laughs> so, you know, in, in thinking about this work, there's, there's maybe some, some problematic issues that can come up. It's like, why is this man who lives in Marin hiring, um, you know, Latino day laborers to pose in his pictures? And it's because these are the people that, like, basically, these people sacrifice so much being away from their families to, to come to California, to go north, to kind of strive for this dream, which, unfortunately, for the most part, is possibly maybe fairly empty or misunderstood. Um, this is Hamilton Field. This is also in Novato. Um, it's a decommissioned military base, and they built this. I actually think this is a senior living center, not necessarily a suburb, but it shares a lot of the same characteristics as the development in the other picture, you know, like the carports and the condos, people of like moderate middle class means finally carving out their own place in society. And you can see that you know these three men are walking down the hill, and then there's this this character right here, and everything that Larry did was so incredibly intentional. And this this man right here is, to me, he looks like a giant. You know, he looks like this eight foot tall, very <coughs> strong, very self assured human being. And I think what's different about those other two pictures, and when I talked earlier about how a photographer kind of manufactures a picture, and how a picture just kind of exists just gets witnessed. 
you don't really see that in these pictures. This could easily be kind of just like a more documentary style picture. So could the one on the left. But in this one, he's using, you know, that the literary or theatrical device of breaking that fourth wall, right? And when that happens, you know, it uses the tool of metafiction to remind you that you're looking at something constructed. And so he wanted you to know, I think, in this picture, that this person was basically placed there. And I think you actually have to confront this figure's humanity so much because he's staring right at you. You know, this is no longer just a fiction or just a story that somebody is telling. These are actually really real people. And I think this is a wonderful picture because of that. Um, there's also this character of the fog and the mist in the pictures, which is kind of over here, the unsuredness of the landscape. And I'm guessing these were all probably taken in between November and probably June of 2000. November 2008 and June of 2009 is my guess. Um, yeah, how am I doing on time? Ten more minutes? I guess I'm used to dealing with 18 year olds who really like to, me to exercise brevity because they want to get out of there. <laughs> yeah, does anybody have any questions or comments? Hmm? When did you die? Uh, December 2009. So just after these. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Correct. What format did he shoot these photographs in? I'm going to make an educated guess. I hope this is right. I'm pretty sure these are all shot um, 4x5 and then probably drum scanned or Imacon scanned and then they were worked up digitally and then printed out. These say they're sequins, so they're probably digital sequins. That's my guess. Was there manipulation of like the skies? Um, were they foggy, or was that maybe enhanced at all? Or I, you know, not that it matters per se, but when I was, I mean, I've only I only printed maybe four or five of these, and this was very early on. I wasn't making these this pictures year? at this point. Yeah, uh -huh. I think that if these were manipulated, they were kind of using the same sort of manipulation that can be done in a traditional darkroom, lightening or darkening certain areas, changing the color cast. Um, and you know that was when I said the thing about make them biblical but not too biblical. Um, that's like really the subtle nuance of his work. Remember, he's so interested in the understated, in the non-dramatic. You know, if you can get somebody to pay attention to something that's boring, you have something incredibly interesting. So, yeah. This this light up in the upper right hand corner. Uh -huh. I, I mean, that makes it look really theatrical. It looks like it's stage lighting or something. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it is? I think it's the moon. <laughs> yeah, and I'm guessing that it's a pretty long exposure, and it is at nighttime, just because the windows are so bright, um, and then the sky is so soft, there's almost no definition in the clouds whatsoever. It's just completely, and also, you know, the tones that are in here is kind of like really typical of an underexposed color negative. I know. Well, the, was there street light or because the, 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 the facades are lit from the bottom, you know, so street light or car light or art, did he always put lights in to light the facades? I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, probably not. I would say probably not. Because it's definitely not the moon causing the... <laughs> I mean, I... Yeah, the, the facades are artificial pulled, pulled out. Yeah, and yeah. I think I think that artificiality is an important thing to talk about, and the you know the, the kind of like how much knowledge is it going to give the viewer to allow them to know that they're looking at something fabricated was something very important to him. He would have he had like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of location scouting pictures, you know, and one of them was just like Home Depot parking lot at noon with a bunch of tree clippings on the ground and he's like, I wish I could make that picture. He's like, that's the most interesting picture I made. You know, but it's not something that would make it in maybe because he didn't consider that the art or it was kind of, again, just for location scouting. It had a pragmatic purpose and really no other. What was it like being a student? Um, uh, I, didn't, I, I mean, I, it was pretty good. <laughs> Um, it's fun to see somebody who you studied with kind of go through their own 
self-conscious feelings of, is this work good, is it not good? Um, uh, I, really liked, I really liked to listen to him talk on the phone to people. It was, he was kind of a complete and total magician with it. It was incredible. Um, and then, you know, eat, eat good lunch and stuff. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I, how was he a total ma magician? Salesman? You mean a sale in terms of sale selling? Sale. Or just, com just incredibly articulate and thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And never, yeah, just just a good speaker, great speaker. Yeah. Talk about his influences or what uh, photographers he was particularly aware of? Or? Gosh. What was the question? Influences, what photographers he was particularly aware of. What thought about? So many. <laughs> um, gosh, I don't know. Can anybody help me out? Well, more, well maybe, maybe if, if you can think about a um, you know a historical lineage or something. Well, I mean, he was a, he was a photographer who studied at the San Francisco Art Institute. I think John Collier was probably a really influential mm -hmm. person for him in terms of someone who was studying visual anthropology and really kind of dissecting mm -hmm. what pictures mean. Mm -hmm. You know. If you look back at when evidence came out, no one was doing that. No one was stripping photographs of their original context and making new work out of it. Right. Andy Warhol was doing appropriation, but he was using the meaning in Elvis, in Marilyn Monroe, and kind of uh -huh. capitalizing on that meaning, where Larry was completely stripping things of meaning and then building it anew. Okay. And so I think he came out of that, that tradition of people really looking at pictures and just how pictures work in a way other than just strictly formal. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. When was he a student at the Art Institute? Uh, 70s, early 70s, mid 70s, I think. And did he teach at the Art Institute? Good question. 80s? I'm going to guess early 80s. And then Lone Mountain and then CCA. C. <laughs> yeah. Probably, it's more something he said to me. He came into my studio when I was a grad student, and he looked at my work, and he's like, these are really nice to look at. And he said, you might be a magician, but is that enough? And then kind of like attempted to, well, just kind of stood there as I attempted to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Which again, I think is, is something that he instilled in all of his students and what makes these pictures so important is that they're not necessarily like flashy, they're not necessarily a spectacle. They are pictures that if you sit and look long enough, you really get something incredibly meaningful from them. So that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. His work was really different, is very different than mine, and I think that's a really wonderful relationship for a student to have with a teacher. What is your work? Um, so I, I, I make pictures of the landscape. <laughs> um, so they're sometimes really big and sometimes really small. Um, and yeah, it's a whole other conversation. So, uh, as a teacher, how do you guide your students to uh, develop their own voice and to be inspired by as opposed to replicate? Gosh, I don't know. I, don't know. Um, I, I try not to give the assignments where it's like, pick a photographer and emulate their work. That's a big one for me. Um, don't show work really early on. Um, if you look at Larry Sultan's baseball card, Mike Mandel did a set of baseball cards of photographers and artists. And on the back, it listed a favorite photographer. Larry's favorite photographer on that card was um, Henri Jacques Lartigue. Is anybody familiar with him? He was a small child in France, and he began photographing before people knew what photographs were, and he made pictures in this incredibly naive, wonderful way, you know, where the framing was weird and off, and he would photograph people throwing cats, like really strange, <laughs> really strange, wonderful, naive, beautiful pictures that don't use the normal conventions of how pictures are made. So I actually try to not teach things like composition. It's my chair here right now. <laughs> um, She's on vacation. She's on vacation. Um, yeah, I kind of just like let him have at it. Where do you teach? San Francisco State University. Uh -huh. a Great years. place. <laughs> Does the museum have work from all of the series that you talked about that he did? Oh, I'm sure it does. 
Do you know? I don't have an Not up, but I'm sure it's here in the collection. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so there's a difference between looking at a painting and looking at a photograph. Um, that's that's and that's like an interesting question. I mean, that's. Uh, I'm gonna say yes. I'm going to say yes, because for the most part, when you're looking at a photograph, you're looking at something that had to exist in some way. You know, and I think one, one thing to point out is maybe, let's, let's, let's for instance look at Stanley Mann's work, who photographed her children, oftentimes without any clothes on, put those photographs in the world. They were painting pictures of young children naked in like the 14th century and nobody cared. And they were doing it up until then. And so photographs are so completely loaded because they do really implicate and point directly at us as opposed to sort of like a fictional, more creative world. Thanks. <laughs>